Avengers Endgame is the biggest event in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to date. And naturally, like other MCU films, it's full of a ton of easter eggs, references and callbacks to previous movies. And much much more. While we previously did an easter egg list for the film on this channel, with like two parts, we've decided to come up with a list that includes every single one that we spotted. Specifically pertaining to easter eggs that appeared in Endgame and not ones that were carried over for Infinity War. So no, we're not mentioning Morgan Stark in this one. Y'all already got that easter egg in the previous movie. So with that in mind, this is our list of all 84 easter eggs in Avengers Endgame. At the beginning of the film Hawkeye is training his daughter how to shoot arrows. He says, you see where you're going, now let's worry about how you get there. This is a meta reference to the MCU and how prior to 2008's Iron Man, Marvel Studios had planned out the trajectory of the franchise. When Clint's family is dusted, we hear the sound of thunder. This is the same sound effect used in Infinity War and Wakanda when all of the heroes were dusted. It. When Tony is recording his message to Pepper, he says the line, don't post this on social media. This is a throwback to 2008's Iron Man when Tony, towards the beginning of the film, tells the military private who wants a photo with him, I don't want to see this on your MySpace page. Oh, it was a different time. Also in that recording, Tony mentions that he has been stranded in space for 22 days. Avengers Endgame is the 22nd film of the franchise. Tony also calls Nebula a blue meanie. This is a reference to the villains from the 1968 animated movie Yellow Submarine, the Beatles movie. In Yellow Submarine, the Beatles travel through the sea of time, which is a nice little relevant reference for Endgame and its plot. Let's talk about Tony's wardrobe for a second. When he and Nebula are fixing the Guardian ship, or at least trying to, he's wearing a black tank top. This is the same outfit that he wears in the Iron Man film while making his Mark I armor while being held hostage in that cave. Speaking of outfits, moving on to Rocket's costume. Rocket's new costume is from the Dan Abnett and Andy Landing Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 comics. The same comics that inspired James Gunn's version of the team in the MCU. After Tony is rescued and returns to the Avengers compound, he gets quite upset during their group meeting. He mentions a line that's actually a callback to a previous film, a suit of armor around the world. He's basically quoting himself from Age of Ultron. I see a suit of armor around the world. This conversation also mirrors another conversation that he had with Cap in which he says, how are you guys planning on beating them? To which Cap responds, together. Tony then says, we'll lose. And Cap barks back, we'll do that together too. Tony's got some fun names for Rocket Raccoon. He calls Rocket a Build-A-Bear and also later on, calls him Ratchet. The latter one is actually pretty funny considering it's a reference to the Ratchet and Clank video game. We soon get another glimpse of Thanos. This is where we get the first glimpse of Thanos in the film. He's retired to a place called the Garden. Now note that Infinity War was filled with a ton of religious imagery, so the Garden lines up well with this, with the idea that Thanos is God and that he retired on the seventh day after his work was done. Another nice tie to the Garden comes from the comics though, in which Thanos, when acquiring the Infinity Gem, for the first time goes to see the Gardener, an elder being who belonged to one of the first races to develop after the Big Bang. The Gardener using the Soul Gem used it to create a valley and was obsessed with peace and quiet. Thanos visits him and then uses the gems he's already acquired to cause the Gardener's death, pushing vines throughout his body, impaling him. When the Avengers go to space to find Thanos in his garden, the honeycomb matrix that appears when the Guardian ship flies through space there is similar to the one that appears in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. In Thanos' garden, he has created a scarecrow out of his suit of armor. This is actually taken directly from the comics. See the similarities? In the scene that introduces us to Thanos' garden, we get a reference to another critically acclaimed film, an Oscar winning film. Thanos runs his fingers along his crops in the garden. This is an homage to the film Gladiator, in which Russell Crowe's character is seen doing the same action during the scenes in which his character is at peace and about to be reunited with his family upon his death. After the Avengers find out that Thanos has destroyed the Infinity Stones using the Infinity Stones, Thor goes for the head. That is a callback to Infinity War, when Thor did not go for the head. We then get a scene that takes place in a support group. Steve Rogers is running the group discussion and we get a cameo from Joe Russo, the co-director of the film. He was also playing the first openly gay character. Not to be confused with first openly bisexual character which was Valkyrie. But what's even cooler than the co-director's cameo is the other cameo from another member of the support group, Jim Starlin. The man who created Thanos in the Marvel comic universe and also is responsible for the Infinity Gauntlet story arc in which Infinity War was loosely based off of. Speaking of cameos, Ken Jeong appears in the film. He plays a security guard when Scott Lang returns who lets him out of the compound. The Russo brothers worked with him on Community, and funny enough there was a point in the Community series where he actually was a security guard. Speaking of Community, Yvette Nicole Brown also makes a cameo. She shows up later in the film at Camp Lahai and takes an awkward elevator ride with Cap and Tony, later to report them as being suspicious individuals. But back to Ken though. When he first notices Scott on the security cameras, he's reading a book, The Terminal Breach by J.G. Ballard. In that book is a short story called Endgame. 
Now, Ballard, the writer, is known for writing post apocalyptic novels and short stories. Moving on to when Black Widow was talking to a couple of the Avengers and Nebula and Rocket via holographic projection. Carol Danvers has a haircut. It's the same haircut that the character had in the comics. But also in the scene, we see a nice little detail of Black Widow's. Next to Natasha's desk in that same scene, you can spot a pair of ballet slippers in the shot. The ballet shoes are tied to her past in the Red Room, with the ballet school being the cover for the infamous assassin training program that we got to see a glimpse of in Age of Ultron. The rat that we see in the van scene that runs over the machine that lets Scott out the quantum realm, aka the one that saves the universe, could be a subtle reference to Disney, aka Mickey Mouse. Rats and whatnot. When Scott Lang returns, his van is locked in spot 616, which is likely referring to the main continuity of the Marvel timeline in the comics on Earth 616. When Scott stumbles upon the Vanished Memorial, he is looking for his daughter Cassie Lang's name. He doesn't find it and instead finds his. But if you look closely, you'll see another familiar Marvel Universe name, Roberto da Costa. Roberto is an X Men character who joins the New Mutants who first appeared in Marvel Graphic Novel issue 4 back in 1982, created by Chris Claremont and Bob McCloud. When the Avengers seek out Tony, there's actually a Callback to Age of Ultron. In that film, at the end, when Tony is discussing things with Cap, he mentions that maybe he should take a page out of Barden's book, Living on a Farm. That's exactly what he ended up doing. When the gang are trying to convince Tony to help out, Tony makes fun of the name that Scott had actually called the plan, Time Heist, which is a reference to an episode of Doctor Who from 2005. That's not the only time travel reference. When the Avengers are testing out the time travel machine, Rhodey and Scott make a bunch of references to time travel rules, which are all basically pulled from the rules of time travel from the Back to the Future franchise. So Something their teammates then make fun of them for. Funny enough, while the bannerfied Hulk says that time travel doesn't work that way, we do see a lot of similarities between Back to the Future and Endgame, with various characters sneaking around their past selves. Speaking of the bannerfied Hulk, this film gave us a glimpse of Professor Hulk, Smart Hulk from the comics, specifically Peter David's comic, where he first introduced the blending of Hulk and Bruce Banner into one persona. Another nice little reference that comes from that scene with Rhodey and Scott and bannerfied Hulk is the mention of killing baby Thanos. This could actually be a reference to the plot of Cosmic Ghost Rider, a more recent Marvel storyline that takes place on Earth TRN 666, in which the Punisher becomes Ghost Rider after Thanos wipes out Earth, and eventually becomes Galactus's Herald when the Destroyer of Worlds wants to take on. Thanos. Cosmic Ghost Rider ends up going back in time to kill baby Thanos, but can't do it, and instead raises the child himself. I Love You 3000 has become a pretty iconic catchphrase after the movie. Funny enough, that might actually be taken from Iron Man 3000, an inversion table that's used as a piece of workout equipment. When Tony reconciles with Cap and presents him with his shield, you can hear the theme from Captain America First Avenger playing. This isn't the only moment in the film. There's a lot of musical callbacks that appear throughout. New Asgard is in Tonsberg, Norway. It's the place where Odin, before passing away suggested where Asgard could find a new home, saying this could be Asgard. That happened in Thor Ragnarok and is also the place where Thor fought Hela. And fun fact, it's also the city where Red Skull acquired the Tesseract in Captain America the First Avenger. As Rocket and Hulk are riding into New Asgard, there's a song playing by the Kinks called Supersonic Rocket Ship. The song is about a ship that's a refuge, which feels appropriate since the Asgardians had escaped Asgard on a refugee ship, the same one that was destroyed at the beginning of Infinity War. And New Asgard is their new refuge. There's a point in which Tony makes fun of Thor's new look, calling him the Big Lebowski. It's pretty spot on. Let's talk about Meek and Korg. Korg specifically. Korg's pineapple shirt is a reference to the pineapple jumper that Thor Ragnarok director and Korg actor Taika Waititi wore at San Diego Comic Con. Speaking of Korg and Meek, the two are playing a video game when Hulk and Rocket arrive. It's Fortnite, the game that recently had a crossover with Marvel Studios. That's not the only reference though, because if you look closely at the Fortnite game they're playing, they're actually facing off against the Grandmaster, aka Jeff Goldblum from Thor Ragnarok. He's going under the name of Noob Master. Clint's new persona, Ronin, is actually taken from the comics. The wardrobe is pretty spot on. The Yakuza member that he's fighting is actually from the comics as well. His name is Akiko, who led the Shogun Reapers in the Nick Fury comic book. The Avengers time travel suit is clearly modeled after Hank Pym's original Quantum Realm suit. You can see the similarities, especially in the helmet. When the Avengers all come together to discuss the locations of the Infinity Stones, the photo that we see of Jane Foster at the Avengers compound when the team are recapping where each of the stones are is the same one that appears in Avengers, the first Avengers film, when Coulson explains why Foster is not around to be consulted. They thought they had ridden her out, but nope, Natalie Portman comes back for more. Vormir is mentioned in the same scene, and Rocket says that it is the center of celestial existence. Some have suggested that this could be a plot hint for the upcoming Eternals MCU film. At one point, you can see the Hulk eating Hoka Hoka Burnin' Fudge ice cream from Ben & Jerry's. It's an ice cream easter egg. 
Funny enough, in Infinity War, Tony Stark had mentioned Ben and Jerry's had named an ice cream flavor after him. Looks like Hulk got the treatment too. When Hawkeye and Black Widow are headed to Voromir, Hawkeye says this is a long way from Budapest. This is referencing Budapest like they did in the first Avengers film. When Natasha says that the Battle of New York is like Budapest all over again, to which Clint responds, "You and I remember Budapest very differently." During the 2012 flashback, the name Doctor List is mentioned. That's Baron von Strucker's chief scientist. He's name dropped after the covert Hydra agents acquire the scepter. That's then followed by the elevator sequence. Now this is a throwback to Captain America: Winter Soldier when Cap was in the elevator with pretty much the same group of people. Almost. He ends up kicking some major butt and it was one of the more memorable fight sequences of the movie. Except this time he doesn't do that, instead we get him whispering to Jasper Sitwell, Hail Hydra. This is actually a nice little tongue in cheek moment that references 2007's Captain America Steve Rogers and the following Secret Empire story arc, in which Cap was revealed to be a Hydra sleeper agent, and secretly a Nazi. That got revised though. Get that they're making fun of it. Cap has another great line that he says shortly afterwards. I can do this all day. He says this when he fights his 2012 self. It's a line throwback to several moments throughout the Captain America movies. But perhaps a more memorable moment when Cap fought himself was after he kicked his own butt, and then looks down literally at his butt and says, "That is America's ass." That's thanks to the internet and all the memes that came out commenting on how great America's ass was when the original Avengers film came out. When the 2014 Thanos finds out about what the Avengers are up to, he calls them unruly. This is actually something that the Mad Titan called them in the end credit scene of the 2012 Avengers film. It's called a thesaurus, Thanos. When Nebula and War Machine are on Morag, we get to see the Guardians of the Galaxy opening, but from a different angle. It's arguably a little bit funnier. Speaking of Morag, War Machine aka Rhodey makes an Indiana Jones reference when he and Nebula go to get the Power Stone, saying that there should be booby trap spikes with skeletons stuck to them. This is an obvious reference to Raiders of the Lost Ark. After Steve and Tony go back to the 70s to acquire more pin particles and the Tesseract, we get a Stan Lee cameo. He shouts out, Make love, not war, as he speeds by in a car past Camp Lahai. But what's even better is his bumper sticker that we see. It says, Nuff said. This is actually a common catchphrase of Stan's that appeared often in Stan's soapbox in the comics. In that same 70s era, we see Captain America wearing a shirt that has the name Roscoe on it. This is a reference to Roscoe Simons, who was Captain America briefly in 1975. He didn't last long. Red Skull actually crucified him and tortured him. Speaking of villains, let's talk about Arnim Zola. When Tony runs into his father, Howard Stark, Howard is looking for Zola. We learn in The Winter Soldier that Zola was the one responsible for Hydra infiltrating shields. He was last seen as an AI in that film. In that exact same room, actually. Speaking of other familiar faces, let's talk about Jarvis. James Darcy reprises his role as Jarvis from the Agent Carter MCU television series. He appears when Howard Stark is leaving Camp Lahai. We also get to see a de aged Michael Douglas. But perhaps what's neater is the retro Ant Man helmet in his lab. It's the helmet that Hank Pym wore in his earlier comic appearances. Perhaps in the MCU, this is just a prototype. We also see Peggy Carter's office. There's a frame photo of Cap that Steve sees that turns out is actually the same photo that she looks at at the end of the first Avenger movie. Let's hop on over to 2014 now. On Vormir, Red Skull's speech is exactly the same one that he gave to Thanos in Infinity War. When debating over who will use the new gauntlet the Avengers have created, Thor says that he's the strongest Avenger and should be using it. This is actually a callback to Thor Ragnarok when Thor attempts to log into the ship and tries to use the codename Strongest Avenger. When Hulk wears the gauntlet, he ends up dropping to the floor in crippling pain. Tony wants to call off the experiment, but Steve, on the other hand, asks him if he can take it. To which Bruce replies, Yes, I can handle it. This is actually a callback to the first Avenger, when Steve was being transformed to Captain America and had shouted, I can handle it. After Thanos bombs the Avengers compound, Hulk ends up holding up a bunch of rubble to save the other Avengers members. This is actually a reference to the cover of Secret Wars issue 4. In the big battle that follows, Thanos tries to push Stormbreaker into Thor's chest similar to what Thor did to the Mad Titan in Infinity War. Except I guess that Thanos wouldn't have known about that yet. Thanos breaks Cap's shield in their end struggle. This is actually a reference to the Infinity Gauntlet comic, in which he does basically the exact same thing. It's also a reference to Tony's vision in Age of Ultron where we see Cap's broken shield lying next to him, while he's dead. When Sam radios Captain America when he's faced with Thanos' army, he says, on your left. This is a callback to Winter Soldier. Twice. Once when the two were running and Steve called it out to Sam, and the second when Steve was in a hospital bed in the film. When all the Avengers finally show up thanks to Doctor Strange and, you know, being undusted, Steve Rogers says the famous line, Avengers Assemble. This line was actually teased at the end of Age of Ultron, but never finished. Pepper Potts shows up in her comic book alter ego, Rescue. It's also the mask that Tony's daughter was playing with at the start of the film. 
Howard the Duck can be spotted in the big final battle. When Wasp shows up, he's just to the right of the frame and he's holding a machine gun. Wasp also says a line, we're on it Cap. It's a nice little callback to Ant-Man and the Wasp, when Wasp was making fun of Ant-Man for calling Captain America Cap. In that same battle, Spider-Man activates something called his instant kill setting. This setting is something that we first saw in Spider-Man Homecoming, except Peter is clearly more under control of his suit now. Right before Tony snaps, he says the line, I am Iron Man. This line is from 2008's Iron Man when Tony revealed to the public his true identity. After Tony has snapped, Thanos sits down. He sits like he did at the end of Infinity War. Except now, he knows that everything is over and he is going to be dusted. At Tony's funeral, the holographic projection of Tony says that we are not alone in the universe. This is another meta reference. It's a callback to when Nick Fury tried to recruit him as part of the Avengers initiative. We also see the arc reactor that Pepper had given Tony on his funeral wreath. It says proof that Tony Stark has a heart. It was a gift that Pepper gave Tony at the end of the first film, back in 2008. There's a bunch of familiar faces at Tony's funeral, including the kid from Iron Man 3, Harley Keener, except he's no longer a kid. Afterwards, Happy Hogan and Morgan Stark, Tony's daughter, have a nice little conversation. He asks her if she's hungry and she says yes and that she wants a cheeseburger. This is a reference to the cheeseburger request from the first Iron Man film after Tony comes back home. In the fun little banter scene we get when Thor gets on the Guardian's ship, he references as Guardians of the Galaxy. This is an actual 2018 Marvel comic series. When Peter returns to high school and gives Ned a big ol' hug, when he first comes into the school, if you look to the right of the frame, you'll notice a familiar face. It's an administrator who is actually being played by Ben Mendelsohn, aka Talos from the Captain Marvel film. Could that be hinting to Secret Invasion? Towards the very end of the film, when Cap is returning to the past to return the Infinity Stones, he says to Bucky, don't do anything stupid until I get back. It's a line reference from the first Avenger. Bucky responds with the same line that Cap had said in the past saying, how can I? You're taking all the stupid with you. When we see Old Man Steve Rogers, he's wearing a tan jacket. It looks like the same jacket that he wore before becoming Captain America in the first Avenger. And then finally, the end credits. We didn't get an end credits scene, but we do hear a sound effect. It sounds like metal clanging. This is actually the sound effect from 2008's Iron Man when Tony was building the Mark I suit. And one final easter egg for you all. There was a line midway through the film that referenced an earthquake under the sea, to which Tony said that we handle it by not handling it. This could be a subtle hint to the existence of Namor the Submariner. Although considering the state of the rights surrounding the character, that seems uncertain. So let us know what you think in the comments below if you think it might actually be an easter egg. Alright friends, there we have it. All 80 for Easter eggs. Tell us if we missed any in those comments below. If you dug this video, hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to Top 10 Nerd for as much MCU content as you can get your eyeballs on. And also check out the nifty little playlist we currently have flashing on your screen. In the meantime though, thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.